Okay, then. so growing up in Northern Ireland through the Troubles, uh, what was your first exposure to reggae? Probably the same as a lot of people, um, in so much as you know, the sort of the Bob Marley records on, on the radio and stuff. I mean, I, 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 and, well, actually, no, going back further than that, it was all the sort of the British pop reggae stuff. I mean, like Greyhound and people like that, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, Marley would have been the first sort of time that it, it, it was kind of taken seriously rather than just pop music, do you know what I mean? Um, and then, obviously, I was listening to John Peel, because so, obviously, I mean, we didn't have reggae bands come over and play. In fact, the first reggae band I saw who did come to Northern Ireland were the Cimarrones, remember them? Yeah. yeah. They came across and played. And, oh, shit. And, uh, that, I mean, that was fantastic, uh, but uh, just to actually see it live. But it was, it was also it was kind of a baptism of fire into what reggae shows can be like. You know, it was like, so, oh, they'll be on stage at nine, you know, you're still sat there at quarter to eleven and no fucking sign of them. You know? <laughs> and then when they did come on, they played like interminably, and, and finally, finally played one song I knew after like, you know, four hours. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And did the music have any particular relevance to what was happening on the streets? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the reasons that we, we covered Johnny Walls uh, straight away, was because, um, you know, there, there was, for all that, you know, their, their, their polar opposites in terms of uh, their location and, and, and climate and all that, if you look at the, the, the parallels between what was happening in Northern Ireland and what was happening in Jamaica at the time, I mean, it was, it was a two-party system. There was, there was a lot of violence surrounding the political systems in both countries. And so, obviously, what, particularly what Bob was writing, was, you know, rang all sorts of bells with us. Uh, I mean, to, to cover Johnny Walls was just the easiest thing in the world. All we did was, I mean, we didn't even change, we, we changed the word Ja to God, and we just threw a couple of Belfast references in, and we could have written, well, apart from the fact that I wasn't good enough to write a song that good at the time, but we could have written it ourselves, you know, I mean, in terms of the actual reference points and yeah. stuff and what it was like, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. And the relationship between punk and reggae is well documented. Um, from your perspective, how did you see it? Um, yeah, well, again, you know, obviously it was, it was very much a London thing. So, you know, being in Belfast, we were kind of cut off from it. Um, when we first came across, uh, you know, we tried to, to go to as many shows and stuff as we could. But uh, there weren't actually, a, a, I mean, there were, there were a number, but a, a lot of, of, well, local bands, local, local reggae bands, tended to play in out-of-the-way venues. They weren't... I mean, you know, I, I saw I saw Culture at the Rainbow, I saw Dennis Brown at the Rainbow, um, but if you wanted to see Misty, you probably had to go to South Hall Town Hall and stuff like that. You know, the, the, the actual sort of, if you like, indigenous British reggae bands didn't tend to play in sort of the, the mainstream venues, and I don't know whether that was prejudice on part of the, the promoters or on part of the venues or whatever, or whether they just, you know, this is, this is you know, uh, uh, this is where we came from and this is where we're staying true to on their part. I honestly don't know, you know. Um, so, yeah, we tried, to, we tried to go and see as many, as many bands as we could, and um, we actually did a couple of, we did a couple of Rock Against Racism shows as soon as we possibly could. Um, we did one, sadly, with, with Misty, which all went horribly wrong, um, when uh, the council decided to cut the power on us because some skinheads had managed to get on the stage. I think they were there to deliberately to try and cause trouble and they managed to get on stage. And uh, so we were shepherded off stage and, and then the council crucially decided to turn the power off and then turned to us and said, okay, you're not, you can't go on until you clear the stage. And we're, we can't clear, the, can't clear the stage and we can't get people to calm down if you don't put the power on so I can talk to them. And, and that all just, you know, this went back and forth, back and forth and eventually we, we, we had to give up and... Uh, and sort of, you know, I, I do remember sticking my head in the Missy's dressing room because they were going all after us and went, guys, I'm really sorry, you know, it's like, because obviously we felt to blame for, for yeah. what happened, and even, though, even though obviously we did our best to distance ourselves from those sort of fucking idiots in the audience, you know. And you did tour with Weapon of Peace, of course, and Wolverhampton. We did. We did. Yeah, we did. And, you know, again, that was, you know, that was, that was also part of the whole wanting to strengthen um, those sort of punk and reggae ties, like you said. Um, you know, we, we, obviously at the time we were... They were getting lots of, uh, you know, lots of albums through from people saying, you know, people wanted to tour with us. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was definitely my choice. As soon as I saw that there was a reggae band, and particularly a British reggae band, um, I, you know, I instantly, I was like, I kind of went to bat and kind of overruled everybody else. Although, to be fair, Ali was, was on my side as well, but it was kind of, you know, uh, I think the others were like, well, maybe we should have somebody a bit more in, in line with us. Like, oh, fuck that, let's get these boys on. <laughs> so, you know. so, which members of SLF were the biggest reggae fans back in the day? Uh, Ali was definitely bigger, a bigger fan than I was. I mean, I was a huge fan, but he, I mean, basically just played, like, he got really heavily into dub reggae and stuff, and he played lots of that all, all the time. I mean, I, I, I liked certain dub records, and even now, I mean, even now, Lego Dub's still one of my favourite records forever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it would have been it would have been the two of us would have been sort of the the, the, the two that were most heavily involved in, in, in listening to the records. Because yeah. again, I was sharing an apartment with Gordon, our manager, and Gordon was heavily into it before 
we, you know, whenever we first started, I was talking to him initially about, about Marley and people like that. He was like, oh, well, if you like that. And then he's like, sort of, you know, he's buying me like Toots and the Mates Hall's records. He's buying me Dennis Brown records. He's buying me Gregory Isaac's records. And so we shared it. And then when I shared an apartment with him, he had all this stuff already. So, yeah, I was just fighting it through him as well, you know. Yeah, so. And then you covered Roots, Radix, Rockers, Reggae, yeah. Bunny Wader, and the Mr. Fire Carmen by the Wading Souls. Yeah. Why those tracks in particular? Well, the Bunny song, I always wanted to do. It was always, I heard it on appeal when I was still living in Belfast. I heard the, the 12 inch version on appeal show and loved it instantly. And sort of went to seek it out and, and bought it. And it's, it's, it's still, to this day, probably one of my favourite records ever. Um, and I couldn't work it. We, we tried forever to try and come up with an arrangement for it, just because I was so mad keen to do the song. And you know, we we, we ended up playing these awful versions that sounded like the Police. It's just fucking terrible. And it sounded not. You know, there was no there was no inspiration to it or whatever. Um, and then eventually, I just started playing it like like I was in Doctor Feelgood, who who were like also another band I really love. So when, as soon as I started playing it like Wilco Johnson, we realised there's only two chords in this song. Yeah. Um, then it was then the thing took off. You know, it was like, yeah. oh wow, we can we can actually play this as a rock song. Um, yeah. Far Coleman um, was just such a great tune. Um, you, you know, we weren't we weren't actively looking for a cover version at the time. It was just it was on it was on a, a, a compilation album that Gordon had. Um, I'm not sure where from. It might have been old, I'm not even sure if they were on Studio One. Probably not. But it was. It was an old uh, compilation album, and it was just one of the tracks on there. And obviously, it's, you know, it's, they stole the tune from the, the, the Bruce Chanel "Hey Baby" song, but um, it was just—it it just suited that whole sort of led back, you know, loping bass style. Yeah. That, uh, and again, Ali was always very good at it as well. So you know. It's yeah. a, and Johnny Woods remains a firm favourite of your live shows. Uh, how do you manage to retain the sensitivity of the subject? And putting such a hard edge on it—is that a difficult balance again? Well, I think that's you know one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons we drag it out. If, if with, uh, that's the, the wrong phraseology, but it's one of the reasons we extend it in the middle so much, is to try and is to try and put that 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 side of the song forward. If you know what I mean? Because obviously, I mean it's you know it, it is a song. No matter what way you slice it, it's a song about a young man being killed. So. Um, you know, it, I think it, it, well, Bob obviously approaches it as sort of you know a, a, a regretful ballad. We wanted to approach it more from the angry point of view, but at the same time, when we play it live, we do sort of stretch out the middle section and, and emphasise the, the the whole mother's loss aspect of the song. Um, in those, but I mean, it still comes back to being angry at the end of the day. A, 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 you know, pointless loss of life. Now, the whole album included the track "Last Train" from the Wasteland, which mm. writes a tough reggae beat. Yeah, and the horns as well are very rootsy. Yeah, uh, the song's about encouraging your countrymen to build on the Good Friday Agreement. It's Good yeah. Friday today, so let's yeah. celebrate that. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a <laughs> impressive link. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Is there any significance on why you use reggae as the vehicle for the song? Um, well, again, it, it just seemed to lend itself to it. You know, I, again, there are so many sort of. I mean, a, a lot of the aspects of, of a lot of reggae songs seem to hark back to almost gospel songs. And there's a lot of sort of inspirational and aspirational. Um, uh, melodies in there, you know. I mean, uh, obviously, a lot, a lot of the, the, the songs centered around the Rasta religion and stuff. So there, there is that sort of gospel feel to it. And I kind of felt that I wanted something that was uplifting, and I wanted something that, you know, I, I wanted. I, I felt optimistic about Northern Ireland, so I didn't want to write an angry song. I didn't want to write something that. Um, would hark back to Alternative Ulster or Wasted Life or Suspect Device or those songs. I wanted something that was looking forward and that was, um, you know, that was that, that, that was actually, like I said, a celebration really. And it was just, you know, it was the best way in the world of doing it. It felt to me, and it obviously it opens out into the in, into the sort of the rock chorus, but um, because that's you know, that's that is what we do. But yeah, I think of all the of all the reggae things we've attempted, that's the closest we've come to actually pulling it off successfully. And, and it was it was also nice to have actually written it myself, you know, because yeah. up until then, most of the reggae style songs we've done, I think the only one previously I'd written was Safe as Houses, uh, and that actually sounded, like I said, more like the Police than, than like a proper you know, reggae band. But because it's someone as you, you know yourself, it, for, it's a deceptively simple music to listen to, but it's bloody difficult to play and get right, you know. Yeah. It's like, so yeah. And the train is used in reggae imagery a lot, isn't the train Ooh. to Scarville Zone? Absolutely, train, yeah, yeah. Train, yeah, yeah. Train, yeah train, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, that, you know, probably on a subconscious conscious yeah. level, that probably was working on me as well, you know, without me realising, you know. Uh, and uh, SLF going to return to the, the reggae groove in the future? I, I mean, I'd like to, the stuff we've got at the moment, we don't have anything in that style for the next record. Um, but there's still a couple of tracks I'd like to finish off. Um, in a way, I kind of didn't 
you know, I, I don't want it to be seen as, oh, well, it's a different thing as well. There's going to be either a reggae cover or something in that style on them, because that's what they do, you know. Um, so, you know, I would never be so presumptuous as to, as to, to make it. So when the time's right, it'll happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it's, it's still something, you know, it's still a form of music that I love. It's a form of music that I play a lot. I mean, if you, you, know, if you look at my iPod, iPod it's, it's loaded down with, with stuff. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure the people in the next room to me won't wonder what the hell you know, sort of King Tubby meets Rockers up town actually is all about whenever I'm playing it in, in a hotel room. Um, but you know, it's it's it, 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 it's it's something that it's, it's something I love. It's just it's it's it, it, it's part of what I am. And right, is there know? any chance of you guys going on the road with the reggae band, like uh, having a punky reggae party, if you like? That would be fantastic. Tour, somebody like Misty and Roots. That would be fantastic. I mean, I know, I know the Ruts did that when, when they were so I'm considering recovering a Ruts song on this tour, they're obviously kind of uppermost in our minds. And I know they did that for, for Rock Against Racism in the past. I mean, it's something I would love to do. I, I think that now, I think obviously when you guys toured with us with Weapon of Peace, our audience may not have been quite so open to it as I think they would be now. I think they're. The, a lot of them are a lot more grown up, and I think a lot of them have realised, you know, exactly where we're coming from. So they might be a lot more receptive to it than possibly they.